Welcome everyone to another episode of Elvis Type Podcast. It's your host Travis. John is on vacation again for uh I don't know what I think for his daughter's birthday. I think that's it. So it's just me today. Um last time I had a blast talking with uh, a guest by myself. This time it's another guest. Today we have Brian Beckham. He is a trial lawyer down in Houston, Texas. He is a pro belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and this conversation is great. Some of the stuff we kind of cover is his journey through jiu-jitsu, um, training martial arts later in life. He's 50. He started jiu-jitsu at 47. Uh, we give, he gives his breakdown of the whole $46 million case with Henry Gracie and his point of view. And it's just a great conversation. There's a lot of good laughs. Um, Brian has a super cool point of view when it comes to jiu-jitsu and helping people and whatnot. He has a computer science degree and a philosophy degree, but he turned into a lawyer because he found the love for helping people. And so his his passion just comes through in what he's talking about. So it's just a phenomenal conversation. I'm super excited for you guys to listen to it. Please go and uh, leave us a five-star review everywhere you guys listen. Check out ElbowsTight.com for Elbows Tight swag. Follow us everywhere, Elbows Tight everywhere. Subscribe on YouTube, all that fancy stuff. Uh, check out our sponsors down below. And yeah, that's pretty much it. If you guys want to follow Brian, everything's going to be down in the description below. If you guys want to go follow him on Instagram or listen to his podcast also. So hopefully you guys enjoy this. Let me know what you think. Leave a individual comment down below if you're listening on Spotify and let us know how you guys like it. So thank you guys so much for listening and uh, I'll catch you later. Peace. Are you tired of waking up tired? Well, your pillow probably sucks, but it doesn't have to. I'd like to introduce you to Mummy, a bedding brand that is revolutionizing the sleep game with their innovative six-chamber pillow. Their patented six-chamber design secures the filling in place so their pillow never becomes lopsided or loses support. It also features a breathable mesh to keep you cool throughout the night. A better and more productive you starts with a better sleep. Go to mummy.com and use code elbows tight for 15% off and free shipping. That's M-V-M-I sleep.com and use code elbows tight uh, for 15% off and free shipping. With free shipping and free returns, there's no reasons not to try it. Let me give you some experience with the pillow. So for one, I've had a pillow that I've been using for 20 years. I know it sounds disgusting, but my entire household fights over mine. So we got this mummy pillow in and I, I got to tell you, I love it. It's cool for one. And that's a big issue for me. I hate a hot pillow. Yep. You know, like you'd wake up throughout the night and you're flipping the thing. I love this pillow. I love the support. And, you know, I don't get much sleep with jujitsu being laid and work. So yeah. I really appreciate anything I get my hands on that's going to improve my sleep quality. Also, it doesn't feel like when I put my head down on the pillow, I'm getting caught up in a rear naked choke with the pillow just surrounding my head and whatnot. It's literally the most comfortable pillow I've ever used. I absolutely love it and I could not recommend it more. Sleep is the most important part of your recovery from jujitsu and, and with Mummy, they definitely have stepped my sleep game up quite a bit. With free shipping and free returns, there's no reason to not try it out. Get 15% off your order at mvmisleep.com when you use code elbows tight. That's 15% off when you use code elbows tight sleep ambitiously with Thanks. mummy hey what's up everyone this episode is brought to you by manscaped and what a perfect time considering april is testicular cancer awareness month to help raise awareness and to fundraise for a good cause the leaders in below the waist grooming partner with testicular cancer society to remind you to check your golden nuggets this month for anything not so golden and while you're down there shave your balls while you save your balls, support a good cause and go to manscaped.com and use our code ETP20 to get 20% off plus free shipping. Since April is National Testicular Cancer Awareness Month, I wanted to take a second to talk about men's health issues that are important to me. Did you know one guy every hour, every day is diagnosed with testicular cancer? So this is a reminder to all men listening check yourselves please manscaped in addition to providing the right tools and solutions for safe and easy manscaping has partnered with the testicular cancer society to spread awareness for men's health and early cancer detection it makes sense right we use manscaped products daily to trim and maintain that region below the waist while you're down there cleaning up your sack why not go ahead and give them a little investigation for lumps changes in any size or any pain i think we can all agree it's pretty fun playing with your balls anyway preach Together, we save balls. Get it? To help remind guys to check themselves for testicular cancer, 
our limited time, you can get their special new edition purple TCS lawnmower 4.0 electric waterproof trimmer. This thing is amazing. Look at this thing. It's, the light's even purple on it too. Ooh. <laughs> this special edition trimmer is a collectible item. There are only 10,000 in existence. So make sure you get yours today while supplies last. Once they're gone, they're gone. With the launch of their special edition lawnmower 4.0 purple trimmer, Manscaped will be donating $50,000 to their longtime partner, the Testicular Cancer Society, to help those impacted by testicular cancer. Get the new Lawnmower 4.0 TCS Special Edition Trimmer and help Manscaped raise awareness to give back the Testicular Cancer Society. Visit manscaped.com slash TSC to learn more about how you can check yourself while enjoying Manscaped products at home. Get 20% off and free shipping with code ETP20 at checkout. Once again, that's 20% off and free shipping with code ETP20 at manscaped.com. Make sure to spread the news and tell your buddies to check themselves in Testicular Cancer Awareness Month. Hey. Brian, how's it going today, man? How you doing? I'm doing absolutely fantastic. Thank for ask thanks for asking. This is the first day, by the way. It's a jujitsu podcast, so I, I need to say this. I've trained six days in a row. This is this is my oh. so I'm I'm resting today. <laughs> I I don't know how you do it. I do three days a week and I'm like broken. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like sitting there thinking like, how am I gonna get through the rest of my week with with, with how much my body's already beat up? How how do you do six days a week? Yeah, great question. I'm glad I'm glad you asked that question. So when I start I started I was forty seven years old and I was oh, kind wow. of in shape and kind of not in shape. I mean, I was in shape in certain areas and not others, but I can tell you where I wasn't in shape and that was grappling because I'd never grappled before. And as you know, and all your audience knows, there's a lot of very specific movements and pa movement patterns with your body that I, my body had just never done before. So when I first started out, it was two or three days of beginner's classes mm. a week at most. And I would get home and I would be so sore, <clears throat> not injured, <clears throat> pardon me, not injured, but just really, really sore. And it, it took a little while, but I remember thinking I'm going to do a little experiment on myself. And that is <laughs> if I do it a lot, if I continue to do it, and I obviously don't train through injury, but soreness is a different thing. If I can push through the soreness, yeah. is there something better on the other side? And what I found was <clears throat> that uh, two things, your body gets adjusted to the movements after a while. And you get better at jujitsu after a while. So the better you are at jujitsu, <laughs> the least, the less chance you you have of getting hurt. Plus, I also learned maybe one of the most important jujitsu lessons I've ever learned, and that's pick your training partners carefully. <laughs> right, so, yeah, especially at yeah. forty seven years old. That's a yeah. that's a little bit later in life than most people started. What what made you want to do it? Uh, what was the final deciding factor for you to jump into it finally? Yeah, so I I've been a fight fan my whole life my brother and I actually when we were in college I remember watching the very first UFC and it was in 19 I want to say 1993 or 1994 but it was illegal in 49 states it was legal in one state and you had to buy a, a tape that you popped into a device called a VCR which most people probably don't know about anyway but you you buy it online or you'd order it through the mail and they'd send you this tape and you'd pop it in there and you'd watch the UFC. And I remember watching my brother and I liked to box when we grew up. We did some Taekwondo and stuff like that. But we we saw this Hoist Gracie kid. And we we're like, holy bleep. This is the most unbelievable thing I've ever seen in my life. And then I didn't do anything about it for almost 30 years. <laughs> and I'd been thinking about, you know, if you're in that ecosystem where you listen to Jocko Willick and Joe Rogan and all those meatheads, then <clears throat> you hear a lot about jujitsu. And I've been thinking about starting jujitsu for a long time, uh, make a very long story or a short story, a little longer than it should be. I hired a lawyer who was a purple belt in jujitsu and that kind of pushed me over the edge. I, I, I talked to him about mm -hmm. it. I said, I'm going to give it a shot. I literally Googled jujitsu near me. And the best gym in Texas happens to be five minutes from my house. So I got really lucky as far as that goes. And so that's how, that's kind of how I started. Just, you know, been interested in martial arts and fighting for a very, very long time and hired a lawyer who was a purple belt and off we go. So 
when you were working with this lawyer that was a purple belt were was there times where it was just like you're just getting lost in the weeds on like your uh your curiosity in jujitsu or was it kind of like you were working and they're like oh by the way uh and you would ask him a question about it like how how did that whole conversation go yeah it's so funny to ask that so i have an addictive personality and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad so i'm like i'm addicted to exercise for for instance which i think is good in general although sometimes i exercise a little bit too much but yeah no i, I as soon as i got into jujitsu it was a full-blown addiction still is today i mean we texted you know we, we we work together uh his name is brendan fradkin and he's we we try cases together and work on cases together he's a phenomenal guy and we use jujitsu metaphors when we're working on cases all the time we're like <laughs> we're gonna tap out the insurance company you know we're gonna put them in a rear naked <laughs> choke and so and, and you know uh, being somebody who's super, super curious and also has that addictive behavior. I mean, I've watched so many YouTube videos. I've watched every single Hodger Gracie uh, TV short you can watch. I've, I've sponsored jujitsu tournaments. I think about jujitsu when I'm not doing it. Uh, I have my jujitsu friends over for the UF. I mean, it's just, it's a, it literally is a, a full blown <laughs> addiction. And I'm, I'm, I'm frankly, I'm, I'm proud that it is. I'm I'm happy to be doing this at 50. So, um, but yeah, we talk about it. You know, I'll, I'll literally tell Brendan, I'll be like, we'll be talking about a case or something. And I'll be like, jujitsu metaphor incoming, prepare yourself. And we'll, we'll, yeah. <laughs> and then we'll hit each other with a cool jujitsu metaphor. So yeah, it's a, it's an obsession. So you, your day job is you are a trial lawyer. How did you get into that to give a little bit of backstory and personality of yourself? Yeah, so I studied computer science and philosophy in college. And I tell people I spent four years behind a computer screen with a bunch of geeks. And I didn't want to do that my whole life. So I went to law school. And what do I do now, 25 years later, sit behind a computer screen with a bunch of geeks? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so I, but, you know... I, I went to law school basically for two reasons. One reason was my mother died when I was 10 as a result of some very, very, very serious negligence. And my dad hired a lawyer. I didn't know about this because I was too young. It was many years later that I found out about it. But my dad hired a lawyer to represent my family and won against the United States government, which is nice. a hard thing to do. So if you like, if you Google Beckham versus the United States, you will see that case, like the case will pull up on Google and you can read all about it. And wow, I, I read about it when I was in my twenties in law school, I read the case for the first time, didn't even know it existed until I was in law school. And that kind of motivated me to do what I did. Uh, and the other thing is when I was in college, I was in a 24 hour, uh, seven day a week military organization called the Corps of Cadets, kind of like a military academy. And at the end of my my senior year, I was in a leadership position and I got to help a lot of kids that were in trouble for hazing or academic misconduct or stuff like that. And I got a huge kick out of helping people. So uh, it was the combination of what happened with my mother and also really, I really, really enjoyed helping people that were in difficult situations. That's kind of how I ended up at law school. So people are like, how, how is a computer science and a philosophy guy end up at law school? Well, there's your answer. <laughs> Yeah, we had a uh, we interviewed one of our friends. His name's David, and uh, he went to school to be a physical therapist. He's a doctor of physical therapy, but through like uh, jujitsu and natural medicine, he realized like you know he he wants to help people in other ways. So it's it's interesting how you know I went to college, but um, it was just this last year through or not these last couple of years through the pandemic. I had two babies going through college and. It was like 100% remote and with a full-time job and stuff like that. And I definitely couldn't have done that if I was any younger than in my 30s. You know what I mean? Like, because I was just like so focused. Um, but it's interesting when people, you know, like yourself, you go for these, I don't know, being a lawyer is like crazy to me, the amount of stuff you guys have to go through and like the bar exam and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's so cool that you're like, no, I really want to help people. And then you found the means and the passion within being a lawyer to do that. How was your passion for jujitsu and your passion for helping people as a trial lawyer? How have they, how have they uh, combined? Yeah, it, it's been, so there's a lot of things that have happened in jujitsu that I would have never been able to predict in a million years. You could have given me a million years and I would not have guessed some of the things that would have happened. So here's one really cool thing that happened. 
I'm six months into my training <clears throat> and a guy at our gym named Pedro Marino posts something on uh, social media that he's looking for sponsors. And I had trained with Pedro and a lot of your listeners are going to know exactly who Pedro is. I had trained with him privately a couple of times and he is an absolutely phenomenal guy. He is just a beautiful human being. And I just liked him a lot. And so I, he posted this thing on social media. I said, Hey, Pedro, uh, I'd love to sponsor you. My law firm will sponsor you. And he almost started crying. He was so happy. And so that, that has created like now, now I sponsor three fighters. So I sponsor Pedro Marino. I sponsor Enrico Camargo, who's the number one guy in his weight division right now. And I sponsor another, uh, I say kid, 25 year old uh, guy named Bruno Matias. So I've, I've, <clears throat> I've got this stable of young kids that are doing awesome things and I get to be a part of it. And it's so much fun. I've also like, sp I've put on two jujitsu tournaments. I've sponsored two jujitsu oh, wow. tournaments. I, I represent and provide legal advice for free all the time to my jujitsu buddies. Most of which has to do with stuff that I don't really do on my, on my day job, immigration stuff, you know, maybe some criminal stuff here and there, real estate stuff. <clears throat> and then, uh, if somebody does have something that fits in my practice area, somebody has been hurt, injured, killed, that know somebody has been hurt, injured, or killed that, then I, I represent uh, a lot of jujitsu people as far as that goes. Matter of fact, I've got a little ad slogan <clears throat> for my law firm. We fight for fighters and uh, you know, it's really cool because there's not everybody at jujitsu is, a, there's some assholes in jujitsu, but most yeah, people 100%. are, most people that do jujitsu are just, at least in my experience, they're just, they're just great people. They're just special people. And <clears throat> again, not everybody, but most people. So it's, it's been a real joy. I've got a skill set that that's valuable to people like my, my legal skills are helpful to a lot of people and being able to help my friends and teammates in the jujitsu community is, I mean, that's, that's extremely rewarding for me. Yeah, I, I bet. I mean, I wish I had a lawyer in my, <laughs> in my, <laughs> in my school. I'd be like, we have, we have like, you know, like some entrepreneurs and stuff like that. I'm always asking them like business advice, but <clears throat> It'd yeah. be pretty cool to have a, you know, like a trial lawyer in there. Be like, hey, man, by the way, my wife you got is one. Uh, sent to collection. Yeah. You got one. Now. You got one now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking to him. Yeah. yeah. I'll definitely be hitting you up on Instagram or texting you yeah, later, yeah. Brian. I got a question. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you the other thing. I, and I have to mail you some swag because one of the cool things oh, about jujitsu is everybody's constantly got swag, right? So I'm wearing some swag for my law firm. You're wearing some jujitsu swag. I've got hats, hoodies, everything. VB attorneys. But what will happen is Opiana Malasheus is, is the head of our gym, uh, Gracie Baja West Chase in Houston. Also, he just opened a place in River Oaks, which is absolutely stunningly beautiful. So if anybody's in Houston looking to train, opiana has got two gyms now, both of which are fantastic. Nice. But he has all this swag, and so he'll come out with a black hoodie, and then two weeks later, a, VB black, a black VB hoodie will hit the market. And so like we... We compete to see who can have the most swag. But anyway, all the jujitsu guys are walking around wearing VB attorney stuff. <laughs> and all the attorneys in my firm are walking around wearing jujitsu stuff. So <laughs> it's like That's a win-win win thing. Yeah, it's a win-win thing for sure. But make sure I got to get your address because I got a whole I got a whole box of swag I want to send you. Oh, dude, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll, we'll definitely do that right after this. And I, I got to get your address too, so. Um, yeah. But you go to a, a Gracie Baja Academy, right? You, you yeah. guys are affiliated with Gracie Baja. Yeah. Did, how do you feel? I, I have a, a couple friends that I talk to online on like Instagram that are Gracie Baja. And how do you feel about um, like the uniformity of the academy? Do you feel like having everyone in the same gi, same rash guard? Do you feel like there's anything that it does for the community like uh, at, that you've noticed? Yeah. So. Uh, and and before I say anything, if I may offend a couple people with some of the answers I give today, and and here's the bottom line: I don't give a shit. Okay, sorry. This is the way I feel. And if you're offended, then you then man up a little bit, toughen up. But I think our I think our listener rate's going to go up after this comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I, this may offend some people, but I don't care. The way I feel about it, and it's because I I think it has to do with. Uh, 
my upbringing. So my father was in the military. My mother was in the military. My older brother was a Marine. My father flew 200 combat missions over Vietnam. His dad was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. My uncle, chief master sergeant. Plus, I was in the Corps of Cadets. So I have this military upbringing that's very deep in my bones. And one time I asked Gopiano, I said, why do we have to wear all the same stuff? And he said, because when we're doing videos and taking pictures and stuff, it looks like crap. If everybody's wearing yellow banana geese and, you know, I, I understand people like, like want to have some fun with it and all that stuff. And I got no problem with it, with that at all. But some people just like, like, I'm sorry, people look like complete idiots. Like my wife will walk <laughs> past and I'll be watching a YouTube video and some guys wearing some weird ass looking no gi banana with feathers on it. And it's like, okay, that, that looks awesome and funny and all that stuff. But people that don't know about jujitsu are going to think you look yeah, like, an, a like a complete idiot. Whereas when we're all wearing basically the same stuff, I just think it aesthetically just looks so much better. I, I don't really <laughs> think it. And, and again, this is my opinion. I'm a purple belt. So Take, take it for what it's worth. Like maybe black belts and people that have been doing this a lot longer than I have will have a lot more to say about it. But I, I don't know that it has much at all to do with the substantive jujitsu. I mean, maybe there's a little bit of a feeling of, of a little more of a team feeling, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit of that. But for me, the big part of it is it just looks better. Like if you just, yeah. you just look sharper when one guy's wearing, instead of one guy wearing a black, one guy wearing orange, one guy wearing red, and one guy looks like a chicken, and one guy looks like a turtle. And, you know. There's camouflage. What is this, a costume party? I mean, we're training <laughs> jujitsu, right? So, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, Gracie Baja, Mac Dojo, and oh, you too strict on the uniforms and all that stuff, but hey, you want to look like an idiot, go ahead. I like looking sharp, and I think our uniforms look sharp as shit, so that's kind of my yeah, I, 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 we, we go to an academy where we have like academy geese and, yeah. you know, uh, like obviously we have like team gear, rash guard and stuff like that, but it's definitely not pressed upon people to, to wear it. Um, but sometimes I, I don't wear it personally cause I have like just my own geese. Uh, I have a little bit of a fancier one. That's like a Carhartt Brown. Uh, and I'm the only, that's like the fanciest gi in the school. And when I wear it, everyone's always like, oh, that's a nice gi. And I wouldn't <laughs> be able to have that moment. <laughs> If we all yeah. were everything the same, but, uh, yeah. John and I both were in the Navy, we're in the military. And so completely understand the uniformity and like the brotherhood and everything like that. And like, you're, yeah. you know, you, you help each other and whatnot. And, uh, but I don't know. I just, sometimes I see those, I go back and forth. Like sometimes you see that no gi gear. You're like, man, that looks pretty sharp. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And then, yeah, there's some people out there. I'm like, what are you doing, bro? <laughs> 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 like what do you what do you or, or even like spanks with like no shirt you know what i mean and i'm yeah, like yeah, yeah. what are you wear? you're like you're grappling another grown man in your boxers like <laughs> exactly I, what, I mean it's already but hey, I mean, there, it's already got some some connotations to it like yeah. certain types of positions and stuff and then you and <laughs> And then you add some more of that to it, and it's like, really? People just That's are shaking their head. They're like, what is going on in here? <laughs> yeah. I so will what, say one thing, though. This is kind of weird, and this is a little bit different topic, but kind of a similar topic. I, I will say this. like, We're not – so when we practice in the gi, we have to wear a rash guard of some sort underneath the gi. So you can't just have the gi on with a no shirt on underneath. So I had never – for you know how long, for as long as I've been training, I had never – worn a gi without a rash guard underneath it and I, I started doing some privates with a brazilian black belt on fridays it would just be me and him and he he would show up and he would just have the gi with no rash guard underneath and i was like why do you do that he said i think it's more comfortable so i started Agreed. trying it during our private lessons and, and i gotta tell you i agree with him like when i first started the gi was super uncomfortable and frankly i hated it i thought it was too hot too heavy i felt like i was wearing mm -hmm. a suit of cardboard and I just didn't like it. I mean, I just did. I just didn't. I like gi more. I thought, or no gi more. I thought no gi was more comfortable, more realistic, and all that. Yeah. I've changed my mind about that uh, late within the last year or so. But but I, the point is, I started. You can't train when there are like uh, people of their sex, women, and stuff without without a rash guard underneath. But when you're doing a private lesson, you can. And I got to tell you, man, I think that is super super comfortable. Plus, 
this is going to sound stupid, but I feel more Brazilian. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like I can move better a little bit. It's yeah. weird. So, uh, but anyway, I know there's a big controversy between Guy and Nogi. I, I have some opinions on that, but uh, I like them both. Bottom line. So let, let's kind of jump into that. Let's, uh, how has your opinion changed about Guy and Nogi in your time doing jujitsu and as you mature as a practitioner? Yeah. So the, the, the short version, of the kind of bottom line version is the better I get at jujitsu, the more I like the Guy. And I think that's mm. because the Guy, and I, I think very few people would disagree with it. There's more technique in the Guy. There's more things you can do. The no gi is, to me, a lot, especially in some of these rule sets, is basically a wrestling match with some jujitsu yeah. mixed in, and that's fun. And I love uh, the wrestling component of it. But I'm 50 years old, and so I don't want to go in there and do double legs all day long against Pedro Marino. I mean, I wouldn't last <laughs> two minutes, right? And so as an older grappler, I can slow you down and control you better when we're in the gi. Now, the flip side of that is I'm 6'1", 220, and played college basketball, so I'm a pretty good athlete. So when I'm no gi, I feel like I can – in other words, people can control me in the gi better too. Like it, yeah. going against black belts in the gi is harder than it is in no gi because I can use my size and my quickness and my athleticism – more in the no gi than I can in the gi. Like I go against Olpiano in the gi, and he's a four stripe black belt, OG in the jiu jitsu community, and he he will choke me from every angle you can possibly imagine. Whereas when we do no gi, I mean he still kills me. It just takes a little longer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I actually and. I, you know, in terms of like, people normally frame it in terms of what's more realistic in a fight, gi or no gi. And, you know, I, there's different viewpoints on that. It depends on where you're in a cold area where people are wearing jackets or you're on the beach and blah, blah, blah. I don't really look at it that much <clears throat> from that perspective as a lot of people. The perspective I look at it from is more about technique and also especially again, as a, as a little bit older grappler, I'm 50 years old. I think it's a little safer to be in the gi. Mm -hmm. I think it, it, in addition to being able to slow people down and control them a little bit, there's more cushioning, there's less wrestling. So I, I would, I strongly recommend that older grapplers, more mature grapplers, uh, at least start in the gi. I, I just think it's a little bit safer. Yeah, I agree. John says the same thing. He likes the gi more because it gives him the opportunity. He's 45, and it gives him the opportunity to kind of, you know, grab something and equalize a little bit better with the younger, more athletic people, you know, because you could. there's a grip everywhere. It's like if they're, if, if I'm it's in arm's reach or leg's reach, yeah. I'm grabbing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, of course, one problem is, and I find, like, lately I've been doing a lot of, sleeve based guards lasso guards spider guards stuff like that mm. and the second you go over to the no gi <laughs> you're trying to do uh guards that are you're like you rap, cannot do yeah, your you're like, <laughs> i want lasso in the no gi yeah so or, or like i'll try like i've been doing this back take off of uh top side control that works great in the gi because i can grip the back of the collar in such a way that i can get to the back pretty quickly in the nogi, you got to like, basically in order for that move, it's the grip has got to kind of go on the shoulder blade, which, you know, three minutes in is, is slick as you know what you can't hold right. on to it. And so well, I, you do have to redesign your game a little bit in the, in the nogi, as far as that goes, especially if you do a lot of uh, gi, because the grips and gi are everything. I mean, they are just yeah. absolutely fundamental. So you, you really start, like, I really dial in my grips and my, positioning of my grips in the gi and then n none of that i mean some of it applies i mean there's you know no gi grips and stuff like that but <clears throat> it's just a different game basically did you feel that uh because you are 6'1 220 that jujitsu was a little bit easier for you when you first started because that's a very advantageous body style for jujitsu yeah. in a lot of ways you know what i mean yeah yeah, I've got long legs so i can triangle the shit out of anybody but the the and so <laughs> 
Yeah, but we've got like we've got a black belt world champion, fifty two year old black belt in our gym. Uh, his name is Frank, who's six eight, two sixty. So holy I crap! I don't care how big you are. There's always somebody bigger. But yeah. but I tell you, so there's no doubt. So here are my disadvantages. My disadvantages is I'm fifty. Okay, as far as that, as far as I'm concerned, that is literally my only disadvantage. Mentally, there's not anybody in that gym that's any tougher than I am. I don't care, and that that applies to any gym I walk into. Physically, I'm, I'm still a good athlete at 50, and I'm big and I'm fast. Here's the here's the downside. So yes, that's all super advantageous, and I've actually gotten to the point now where I, I'm I'm really working on pressure taps, and smother taps, and stuff like mm. that. Mother milk. And, mother's <laughs> milk. You yeah, exactly. And if you, if you're if you're if you weigh 220 and you know how to put pressure on people you can pressure tap them and but the downside is when the six foot five inch 250 pound former division one college wrestler or the 6 11 260 pound european basketball player walks into our gym who who do they pair them up with they pair them up with, the, with me the bigger guy yeah. so yeah. It's not like I'm going against people all the time that are 50 pounds lighter than me. I'm going against guys that are 50 pounds heavier than me. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, man, that can be a <clears throat> that can be quite a quite a challenge. So uh there there's there's pluses and minuses to being my size. Uh, you know, the other thing about having long legs is they 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 make a very tasty target for your training partners. Like yeah. it, uh, like it's a hot, harder to hide my legs because they're you know, kind of all over the place, but anyway. Yeah. Cody, our, <clears throat> our school owner, he's a brown belt. He's six, five, two twenty, two thirty, 230. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> watching him do like anything like X guard or, uh, single leg X or, you know, anything where he has to wrap his legs around people besides like a triangle or something like that. Um, yeah. he even admits it. He's like, I don't play a lot of closed guard because there's a lot of space. My legs are so long. It just, yeah. it's, it's not as it's not as good as if like I'm I'm five eight two ten like my closed guard is a little bit tighter than his. I mean, granted, you know, relative, but it's just you know, I. But when I roll with him, to your point, uh, when he puts pressure on me, you know, I don't really tap the pressure anymore. But there's moments where I'm like, why do you hate me? Like what? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, you know, I'm that was that you. was the biggest thing to. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so I'll tell you, like, just take an example. Let's take a couple guards. So De La Hiva guard, I can actually get my De La Hiva hook all the way past your opposite leg. You know what I mean? Which yeah. is, a, which is a real advantage. And I can do some damage with it, with that De La Hiva hook, just switch it over to a, like a uh, butterfly type guard. And it's hard for me to get my legs in tight and get my butterfly hooks up under you you know the the mm. famous uh, marcelo garcia butterfly sweep it's hard to get my legs in like that whereas a guy with shorter legs he can he can get those butterfly hooks in yeah from anywhere you know and so and that's one of the things i like about jujitsu you know every single time i think well there's nothing i can do about this turns out there's a solution to it i mean every time there's a solution the other thing I found, by the way, along those lines is every time I'm doing something and it seems like it's too hard, that always means I'm doing it wrong. Like, I'm, yeah, preach. There's a more efficient way to do it, right? Like, too much effort is a signal that you're screwing up. So, anyway. yeah. Yeah. So, when, as a, uh, you know, you own, you have your own law firm, <clears throat> I'm sure you interact with a lot of people that don't do jujitsu. Is there any times that you kind of have to, uh, like decline or how, how can I not, not decline, but um, what are some common misconceptions that you have to tell people when you tell them that you do jujitsu? Like, do they automatically think like you're an aggressive person? Like you can't, you know what I mean? Like, is there any misconceptions yeah. that come along with being a practitioner in your line of field? I think there's maybe some misconceptions. And so I have a lot of people that <clears throat> I, I post a lot of story content on Instagram, like different roles and stuff and videos. Mm -hmm. Obiana calls me the video king. <laughs> and I, I post stuff mainly of, you know, good, good moves I've made, but I also post videos of me getting submitted and things like that. And I, and I think so, so a lot of the point is, is a lot of people, especially people that are in their forties, like me or, or 
maybe even their 50s, they're seeing this. And I, it, there's a lot of people my age, including my best friend, who I'm real happy to say I convinced him to take up jiu-jitsu, and he's totally addicted nice. to it as well. So i got a lot of friends that have kind of followed my lead into jiu-jitsu. And I, I've got a friend right now who wants to go to this River Oaks gym that all piano opened up which again is it looks like an apple store it's so nice wow uh, but i think he's nervous because i think he thinks like a lot of people might like i thought before i walked into the gym i mean i you got to keep in mind i walked into this gym and i didn't know a single person nobody it wasn't like i walked in with a friend i just walked in and there's these people there's you know plenty of nerds there but there are people there that look like absolute killers like killers i mean Opiano is an intimidating looking guy. I didn't even want to look him in the eyes for the first month of training, but I was super intimidated because I thought it was a bunch of meatheads beating the shit out of each other. Pardon my language. Yeah. But, and, and I think that's what a lot of people think. I think a lot of people think that jujitsu is about going in there and beating people up and being tough and all that stuff. And <clears throat> it's, that's the misconception that I think, uh, is hardest to overcome, especially with older people. So like all the time, what, what was I doing when I was 47 years old, trying to decide whether to start jujitsu at that age? I was Googling, is it too, is 47 too old to start jujitsu? Is it too late? Like, is, yeah. it, is it too late? And every single article says, of course not. It's not too late. I don't, I think you can practice jujitsu in your sixties and seventies if you do it the right way. But that message doesn't really get out there as much as I think it should. I mean, it's a young man's sport. The famous people, the Gordon Rhines and all those Panicky Rod, Rods, all those people are young people. And us, quote, I, I don't like to say I'm old because I, I don't like to put those thoughts in my mind. I don't feel that old. And frankly, I can kick the shit out of most 40-year-olds. So, so I'm, I'm <laughs> physically, I'm not that old. But anyway, the more mature grapplers. I like that, more mature to, grapplers. Yeah, They need to have a different kind of, you know, uh, way of looking at what it is we're doing and like yesterday i rolled four or five rolls and i was sitting there talking to a black belt i rolled with who's my age a great guy and we're watching we're sitting out a roll watching everybody and i'm like this is the most complete type of exercise anybody can do i think you get stretching you get strength you get cardio you get the the team you get the competitiveness i, I was like i literally can't think of another sport where you get all of that and Mm -hmm. that kind of pitch right pitching to people in their 50s like me that are starting to feel you know i need i need to kind of capture some of that youth back go do jujitsu but don't look at it as going in there and getting in a fight every time i mean i remember opiana we were doing a private lesson six months in or so and he says all you guys think this is fighting you think you're you think you're coming in here and fighting when you start out and it's not until you realize you're doing jujitsu and there is a difference that you mm -hmm. actually start getting better. And so I, I think uh, in terms of like people that are my age, getting more people my age to participate in jujitsu is good for jujitsu for a lot of reasons. Well, people my age have money. Everybody in jujitsu is freaking broke, it seems like. So, you know, <laughs> Bring in sponsorship money, bring in, <clears throat> yeah. you know, tournaments. I mean, we need more people that are older doing jujitsu. I think it's just good for the sport, but we got to make sure we pitch it uh, in the right way and overcome a lot of the fears. I mean, I was, a f I was scared to death. I'm not afraid to admit it when I first started doing jujitsu. I mean, I was afraid, like, I didn't know what was going to, am I going to get my arm broken? I don't know. Yeah. And I had to kind of overcome that and. A lot of people just won't even won't even make the effort to overcome that. So we need to have a better message, I think, for for pe people and, and and for women too, for that matter. I think, you know, my daughter's done jujitsu with me. I cannot get my wife to do it yet, but we'll me see. neither. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying. I'm still trying. We've been doing it for about five years now, and I'm always like, babe, just come to jujitsu. Babe, come me to jujitsu. Me and too. And she's not she's not into it yet. All three of my kids have done them, both my boys and my daughter has done it just for self-defense purposes. But I, I think like if you have a teenage daughter and you don't teach her a little self-defense, you're not doing your job as a parent. Like that that's part of being a dad is teaching your kids a little bit of self-defense and real self-defense, not, you know, the Steven Seagal 
nonsense he's seeing on the page. <laughs> Where he's like throwing people with his brain waves and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna not gonna channel your inner chi and knock these people yeah. down. They're definitely yeah, gonna yeah. still come right at you. So, exactly. but you you mentioned in there that you know you physically feel younger. Um, yeah. and for the most part, what kind of training do you do uh, outside of jujitsu, mentally and physically? Um, because I know you're big <clears throat> into like leadership, spirituality, and all that stuff. Like, what kind of yeah. uh, mental and physical training do you do also? Yeah, so I have a routine that I've kind of developed that's helped me stay in pretty good shape. So I lift weights. Uh, <clears throat> I only do that two or three times a week. The main reason I, I'm not lifting weights. So I look good on the beach. I'm lifting weights to strengthen the muscles and the tendons and ligaments that I use in jujitsu. So it's a lot of shoulder, a lot of core work, glute work. So when you're, you know, bridging and pushing people and stuff like that, but <clears throat> probably the biggest, uh, kind of recovery thing that I've, started doing in the past couple of years is I bought a ice, a plunge pool and a infrared sauna for my house. Oh, so I'm jealous. My routine, I'm telling you, man, it's a game changer. My routine. And so I train at lunch and what I do every, before every lunch class is I sit in my sauna for 15 minutes and I meditate. There's my mental training. Plus I get my body kind of loose. And then when I'm done, I go and jump in the plunge pool for a minute or two, pop out, go train. As soon as I'm done training, I get back and I lift weights. I don't lift weights for that long, 15, 20 minutes, just enough to kind of, you know, keep the uh, muscles that I need to do jujitsu. And then every evening after dinner, I do 25 minutes in the sauna and another two minutes in the plunge pool. That the sauna and the plunge pool combination, I don't know if it's, I'm going to live any longer. I don't know if it's good for having heart attacks or cancer or what, but I tell you one thing I know for sure, it sure makes me feel good. It makes me feel really, really good. And I didn't, I was originally going and paying 30 bucks for a 30 minute sauna, 20 minutes across town. And I got so addicted to it. My wife was like, we just need to buy one of these things. But for people that are thinking about options for recovery, that infrared sauna is a absolute, I've been telling everybody this, it is a game changer. Highly, highly recommend. Yeah, you can find them on Amazon too. I've been looking at them on Amazon and you can get one hundred, two hundred bucks, like a little little thing that wraps around you and you just sit there and it's got the yeah. red lights in it and infrared lights and whatnot. I've been I've been looking at doing that too. Um and if you don't have a tub or a cold plunger, whatever, you can also take cold showers. Andrew Huberman, I don't know if you listen to him, he talks about, 100%. you know, yeah. <clears throat> even like a five minute cold cold shower. He's like the whole yeah. idea behind it is just getting cold. You know, because yeah. the the mental training that it takes to get cold is is uh, incredible. Also, you know what I mean. Like, yeah. and I think that's a big thing with jujitsu is like we're constantly putting ourselves through adversity. You yeah. know what I mean. Like, there's we're every every class either we're tired, we can't figure something out, or you know, there's there's just so much problem solving. And you know, as a as a leader, I'm sure that's helped you out quite a bit. How has jujitsu helped your your philosophy and leadership as you approach you know your day job and as a parent too? Count count countless ways, countless ways. <clears throat> too many to mention. I'll try to think of two or three big ones. So here's one, and this is really really a big deal to me. My oldest son went to college this year, and he was trying to decide whether to join a fraternity or whether to join the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M and be the fourth Beckham, fourth generation of Beckham men to do that. And <clears throat> I had just started jujitsu about a year and a half before that. And I was really encouraging him to choose the manly route, which was the Corps of Cadets. And he did. And I think the reason he did it is because he saw his dad out there scrapping with 25 year old Brazilian black belts. And so when I said that to him, I had more credibility than if I was some overweight, out of shape, drunk, mm -hmm. lazy dad, like jujitsu has given me moral authority when I, because you, you know, for people that have kids they, that are listening, they know this kids do not care what you say. They care what you do. And if they see, if your kids seeing you out there doing hard things, working, you know, being uh, tough mentally, then they're going to listen to what you say a lot more and they're going to, they're going to be like that themselves. So, so that's one way. Uh, the other way is, you know, if I'm rolling with 
six eight, two hundred and seventy pound world champion black belt Frank, <laughs> and I'm underneath him, and he's smash, and I'm inverted, and he's smashing the hell out of me, and I can't move or breathe. I, I mean, you think some nitwit pencil necked insurance adjuster is going to intimidate me? Of course not. Like I walk out of that jujitsu gym with a with the with a level of personal self-confidence that translates into everything else I do in my business. And the third thing is, I don't know if, if, if some of your listeners may have had this experience, but I certainly did. When I started doing jujitsu early on, I'd be walking down, you know, in the park or I'd be at a kid in one of my kids sports games and I'd be scoping out all these dads and I'd be like, man, I could beat the crap out of yeah. them. <laughs> <Yeah. That's such laughs> I, I think uh, for that guy, I would do an arm bar. For that guy, I would single leg him, <laughs> and then I would get on top of him and choke him. On, you know, and, and so I was like thinking about this all the time, and like just waiting for somebody to try something on me. But then after a little while, it it, it kind of gave me this. Maybe the best word is calmness. Like yeah. when I'm when, when I'm around a group of people, when I'm in a group of people. Most people don't know what would happen if things went south because they just don't know. They have no yeah. idea. I know what would happen. Like I know, generally speaking, what would happen. And it gives you a level of kind of poise and a level of calmness that, I mean, if, if, if you know you can defend yourself, you don't have to act like an idiot, right? Yeah. The guys that are yapping at the bars and making the most noise, those are the biggest sissies in the world because they're trying to prove something it's the calm jujitsu guy or the calm Muay Thai guy standing over there those are the guys I tell I tell my boys all the time I'm like the guys you got to watch out for are the guys that don't say anything <laughs> the guy that's jacking his mouth all the time is not not somebody you need to worry about that much it's, it's his buddy sitting over there looking at you quietly <laughs> Not saying yeah. anything. that's the guy you got to be careful about right <laughs> yeah i completely agree man i definitely think when you know there's a reason why you know a lot of white belts will go to like house parties or parties with their friends and be showing <laughs> the power of jujitsu but yeah. at i'm i'm at the stage now like you mentioned where um if someone wants to you know pipe up or whatever it doesn't bother me any jocko always talks about it he's like the first thing you should do in self-defense is get away right get like away. i already know yeah. like I'm just, I, I don't even care. Like you can say whatever you want, do whatever you want. Just don't touch me. Like yeah. none of, nothing you can say or do is going to be mean anything to me. You know what I mean? That's like right. I won't give you that power. You know yeah. what I mean? And, and I honestly think it's from, you know, just constantly being humbled, you know, like yeah. we're just always humbled. Like, like you mentioned earlier, you know, you're six one two twenty athletic, you know, you, you, you could put a hurting on someone but there's always someone bigger and badder. There's always no someone that's going to come in <laughs> and, and show you how it, how it can be. You know what I mean? So I think there's so much value in as a man, as a woman, as a child. There's so much value in people experiencing that on a regular basis. And it doesn't have to necessarily be martial art. It could be at work. It could be anywhere in school, right? I think I think failure and being humbled is something that we need more in this world, you know? No doubt. No doubt. My first jujitsu class, I'll never forget it. We're working on specific training on side control. I was paired up with a purple belt at the time. He's now a black belt. His name was Jake. And he's a 45 year old bald Jewish computer scientist who weighs 160, 165 pounds, something like that. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I think I can probably push this guy off of me at least. Like I can probably shove him physically off of me. And 30 seconds later, when I tap from exhaustion and he could have arm barred me and showed me unconscious 15 times without even trying. I, and I think what happens is, so what, what happened to me when that occurred was I was like, holy shit, I have to learn how to do that. But I think some people, they'll come into their first jujitsu class, they'll get completely humbled and they'll never come back. Yeah. Whereas some people will get completely humbled and they'll be like, I needed that. Like I needed to be humbled and it's good for me to be humbled. I mean, it is good for me to be humbled. I, sometimes I'll watch, you know, I'll roll with Enrique <clears throat> and he's a, I think he's a medium lightweight now, something like that. He's a brown belt and he'll 
kill me. And then I'll watch him roll with Pedro, and Pedro makes him look like a white belt. And it's like, you just realize how there's like levels to this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And then old Piano, who's like 46, who runs our gym, he's forgotten more about jujitsu than anybody in our gym will probably ever know. And like, there are moves that he, it's amazing because I'll be like, I'll be on, a, on we, we train on Friday. Some of the time I'll be like, here's what was going on this week. Like I was having trouble with this particular thing. And he'll be like, do this, this, and this problem solved immediately. Every single thing I ask him, he has an answer to it. It's just absolutely amazing. But, but yeah, it teaches you, it teaches you. And the other thing, by the way, it teaches you, I think, is there's a lot of dangerous people walking around that don't look mm -hmm. dangerous. And so it's a bad idea to get in a fight, period. And you just never know. Forget about weapons. I mean, weapons is one thing, but you just never know. Somebody has some training and, and they're going to, they're going to embarrass you in front of your girlfriend. Like the first thing you need to do is look at their ears. If their ears yeah. look funny, <laughs> stay the hell away. Right. Yeah. Did you see that video last night? It looks like uh, in New Orleans, Nate Diaz puts a guy to sleep with a standing guillotine um, in the middle of the streets. And, uh, really? you know, some they're, like they're about to get jumped. Some guy shoots in for a double on Nate and he just, boom, guillotines him and drops him. And so I, w I would love to get your perspective as a lawyer on the uh, legality behind using jujitsu in the streets, yeah. if possible. 100% um, legal. At what point, it's 100% legal, but at what point is, do you, is it taken too far or you might run into issues? Because the guy knocked his head, he cut his head open and he was like, had a skull uh, laceration from hitting it on the ground. As a self-defense, would I be liable for that because I put him to sleep and dropped him on his head? Or, like, how, how does it work? It, it all depends on uh, how, how good you are at something. So, like, for instance, uh, a black belt is going to be judged different than a white belt. A white belt that puts somebody in a guillotine, uh, first of all, a white belt probably is not going to even know how to do that. And if they do, they're, they're going to miss half of the details. And it's probably not going to work. But if a black belt does it, he can kill you. Like he can legitimately kill you if he wants to. And so <clears throat> black belts are judged by a different standard and they should be because they know more. So if Nate, for instance, were to, and I haven't seen the video, but if he were to put the guy to sleep, drop him, let him fall to the ground, not a big deal. If he were to let him do that, hold the thing too long to where he like damages his vocal cords. And he, he was doing that on purpose and you can see him digging, digging the knife edge. in. you know, that's a totally different story. So it all depends on, <clears throat> it depends on this. It, it's very, uh, dependent on the circumstances. So if somebody, I'll tell you in Texas, we actually have mutual, we have mutual combat rules. So you can agree in Texas, we're going to fight and whoever wins the fight wins the fight and the police can do nothing about it. Hmm. So it also depends on the state you're in. In Texas, the rules are extremely uh, more towards the self-defense community. Like you basically can do almost whatever you want to do to defend your, your property and your family, whereas other states might have different rules. But, it, it, but like I said, it's going to be context dependent. I mean, if a guy is like saying, leave me alone, leave me alone as you're, as you're breaking his elbow joint, I give up, I give up snap. That's, that's not acceptable anywhere. I don't care what the situation is, but if a guy has a gun and you grab the gun out of his hand and choke, try to choke him unconscious and you do it too hard and you break his neck and kill him, well, fuck him. he was trying to kill you. He had a gun. So your response to that was commensurate with the threat. Like it depends on like the, if the threat is, is that you're going to die, then you can respond with that same level of force. If the threat is just oh, a couple college kids in a bar and you're getting in a fight and you punch each other a few times and one of your buddy comes over and stomps on his head and kills him, that's not commensurate with the threat. And so that guy, the guy that does the stomping is going to get uh, in trouble criminally as he should. So, so it's all about kind of the circumstances and the balance. But for people that are listening, if you are legitimately defending yourself 
you are free to use legitimate jujitsu in any way you want. And if anybody gives any of your listeners a hard time about that, give me a call and I'll represent you. <laughs> but look at that, guys. Look, now everyone has the perks of Brian at their disposal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so let's I want to uh, let's jump over to obviously the gigantic thing that just happened in the jiu-jitsu community with the 46 million dollar lawsuit. I'm sure yeah. as a someone that sues insurance companies that you know you you look at those insurance adjusters and you're like, "Bro, you better give me exactly what I want or else I'm going to rear naked choke you." How, <laughs> what do you make what do you make of this whole situation? Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to make one comment before we talk about this, and that is I have not read the transcripts of the court proceeding. So I'm familiar with uh, Henry Gracie's testimony. I'm familiar with the basic move that was being done and kind of what happened. But it's ir it would be irresponsible for me to comment too much without having done my own homework. But let me tell you, let me tell your listeners generally what we're talking about here, because I think the framing of this has gotten a little sideways, okay? What is really happening behind the scenes in any lawsuit like this? Here's what's happening, okay? That gym will never pay a penny. Never. They will never pay one penny, okay? They are in no financial risk at all, okay? Mm. The insurance company that they have paid premiums to for however many years they pay premiums to that took their money when it was time to protect that gym, let them down. Anybody that wants to get mad about this case needs to be mad at the insurance company because they were the ones that chose not to settle. They were the ones that chose not to pay this paralyzed person a fair settlement. And they could have. And so people think like, oh, Henry Gracie was an expert witness. And I, you know, I got some questions about his role in that. I, based on what I've seen and heard, it seems to me like some of the things he said about separating white belts and upper belts, that's just that's just not the case in any jujitsu gym I've ever been to. So, matter of fact, the black belts and the white belts training together is a great thing because you get better and all that stuff. So I have some questions about some of his testimony. But at the end of the day, people need to understand, especially jujitsu gym owners, buy your insurance, pay your premiums, and make sure your insurance company takes care of you because that is what you are paying them to do. And so the real anger that I have about this case is the fact that the, and by the way, for people that don't know, the insurance companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars in propaganda campaigns to convince people that law, there's something wrong with lawsuits. Why are they doing that? They're doing that because they make more money. And they have insurance companies have special rules. Like I'm not allowed as a lawyer in court to tell you as a juror that this person has a $10 million insurance policy. I can't even say the word. I can't even talk about insurance. Okay. Why? Because the insurance companies know if I did, the jury would be like, okay, well, it's an insurance company. You, you guys need to pay this. And so mm. the deck is completely stacked in the insurance company's favor. Now let's talk about the actual lawsuit itself. There will never be $46 million paid by anyone for any reason. The case will be appealed. It will ultimately be settled out of court. It will be settled by a multi-billion dollar insurance company. That's what happens in basically every one of these cases. Now, the insurance company is going to be spreading propaganda and talking about all these gym owners going out of business. It's all utter and complete bullshit. It's complete nonsense. Now, let's back up just a little bit on the Henry. I think part of the thing that people have been real upset about is Henry Gracie serving as expert witness for the plaintiff. Okay. And I, I think that's perfectly legitimate. I frankly have my questions about that too. But here's my, here's, here's the question I want people to ask themselves. Where was the expert witness on the other? Where were the lawyers on the other side? I mean, what were they doing? Did you not have a lawyer on the other side that knew something about jujitsu that could tell the jury? that some of this stuff that Henner was saying was nonsense? What, what, I mean, what were they doing? Why didn't they hire they, an expert? Like I mentioned before, my buddy Adolfo, he had that lawyer on. Uh, come to find out, I think Clark Gracie was on the defense. I think Clark yeah. Gracie was representing the defense. So, yeah. so what, But Henner what, obviously so, has that polarizing personality, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. But, like, what, what about the lawyers? So, 
you know, and I, was, I used to say this about the O.J. Simpson case. Do I think O.J. Simpson killed those people? 100% I think he killed those people. Do I think it's the jury's fault that he got set free? Absolutely not. It was the prosecutors who did a horrible, horrible job. I mean, putting on that glove in front of the jury without seeing if it tested, if it fit first, all these different mistakes. The reason O.J. Simpson got acquitted is because the prosecutors sucked. They were terrible. And these insurance companies, you know what they do? They, they, they've started bringing lawyers in-house instead of hiring lawyers to represent their policyholders. Do you know why they bring them in-house? Because they can pay them less. So what ends up happening mm -hmm. is when you're going against me, like I'm suing some company, and the insurance company hires the shittiest, cheapest insurance defense lawyer, what the hell you think is going to happen? I mean, it's me, the black belt lawyer, against going against some white belt lawyer. I'm going to beat him every single time. And but but this gets this all gets back to follow the money, right? I mean, that's pretty good advice in life. You want to know what's driving something? Trace the money back. And when you trace this lawsuit back to the source, every single path leads to an insurance company not doing what it's supposed to do. So how how can we have a lot of academy owners out there that listen to this podcast. A lot of them actually are junior belts too. Uh, like I know of a couple in Thailand that are blue belts, you know, and they have their own academy out there. What advice would you give them to kind of bulletproof their academy from a situation like this? Yeah. So great question. And it's very dependent. The, the law, at least in the United States, the laws are different state by state. So Texas may have a different law than California, which may have a different law than New York, which may have a different law than Florida. I practice in all 50 states. So I'm kind of familiar with a lot of the laws as it relates to this stuff in all 50 states. And as long as, let's just take Texas, for example. As long as you purchase insurance from a reputable insurance company. In other words, don't, if you're a gym owner, don't go, what's the cheapest insurance I can buy? <laughs> right? Which is what a lot of us do. Like you look at these car insurance commercials, we're the cheapest. And I'm like, well, shit, I ain't buying you. You suck. I'm going to buy something that's actually worth, worth spending money on. So buy good insurance from good in insurance companies. Make sure that your students sign the appropriate release forms, just like any sport. You go skiing, you go scuba diving, you go do jujitsu, you're going to sign these release forms. And don't be a dumbass. Uh, don't do stupid things like don't do obvious stupid things. I mean, if you're a black belt and a new white belt comes in and wraps his legs around you and you stand up and you slam him as hard as you can on the mat, that's completely inappropriate. And if you do that and hurt the person, you should be responsible, right? Because that's being an idiot. But as long as you are, and I'll tell you the other thing that a lot of gyms do now, which I think is a good idea is make sure you videotape. Have, have cameras in the gym yeah. so you have a record of what actually happened because if you don't have a camera, somebody could say basically whatever they wanted to and you don't have any proof uh, to say that they're wrong. So like we have cameras in our gym so we know everything that's going on and I think that's really uh, a good thing. But the thing is, you know, when you walk into a sport like jujitsu, the law says you are accepting some risk. I was just about to say, there's some risk yeah, a set, like we have to sure. assume. For sure. It's like if you're, so, and this this is kind of the way I like to think. If you're skiing and you're just going down the ski slope, boom, 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 and then you something happens and you break your knee, you, you cannot sue the ski resort, okay? If you try to, not only will you lose, you'll end up paying the ski resort's attorney fees. That would be a completely frivolous case, okay? On the other hand, if you're going down the ski slope, and there's a massive hole that somebody's dug and there's no markings around it and they don't warn you and you go into that hole and you get hurt, then they're going to be responsible because that's completely unreasonable. It's the same thing in jujitsu. If you go into a jujitsu class and you get, you know, ligament torn or your knee hurt or, you know, black eye or whatever, well, fucking what? That's part of jujitsu. That's part of the risk you accept. But if you go into a jujitsu and some guy takes his finger and shoves it into your eyeball, that's a, you know what I mean? That's like not jujitsu. So yeah, it's really the line between what is normal and what is reasonable and acceptable and what isn't. And most people 
when they look at a situation, they can tell the difference. My understanding of the particular move that was done in the $46 million case was a back take that involved a, a certain position where if the, uh, the guy's back you were taking doesn't duck his head, he can kind of get his neck hyperextended. But I also heard that the, the guy was a, a very experienced wrestler or something like that. So, again, all these facts are really important. The only people, by the way, everybody's got all these opinions about this case. The only people that really know what happened are the 12 jurors that made the decision. So they heard all the evidence and something about it. <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe that insurance company made him mad or something. Yeah, definitely in the times we are now, um, I definitely, the only thing I worry about is, you know, the slippery slope. We talk about it in business school, you know, this, or like when it comes to like, uh, um, like the constitution or law or stuff like that, like the slippery slope, how much do we allow before it starts to get out of control? And, you know, people see a $46 million case and they're like, well, I don't want 46, but I'll take two. I'll take 800 grand. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, yeah, Hey yeah. man, you want to go ahead and come in and act like we don't know each other. And then, you know, you break my leg because of whatever, and then we can split or something like that. And I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think there's people like that in jujitsu, but $46 million opens a lot of people's no eyes. No doubt. No doubt. You know what there's I mean? No doubt about that. There is absolutely no doubt about that. To touch on the Henner side of it. I, th I think my issue with, with, uh, the whole Henner thing isn't necessarily him being an expert witness or saying, you know, the standard of care of jujitsu, this arbitrary thing that he just kind of came up with and, and yeah. whatnot. Um, my whole thing was, you know, I follow him on uh, social media and I felt like everything that came along with him talking about it was a, a billboard for Gracie university. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they're like, Oh man, this black belt was careless at Gracie university. We don't do that. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah. that to me was kind of, I was like, come on, man. Like yeah. granted, you know, if you want to charge a hundred thousand dollars for your testimony, by all means, that doesn't even bother me. And to get after it, obviously you have years of experience that a lot of people don't you've rolled with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. but I, I just, I felt like it was kind of like a distasteful in my opinion on, on doing that at the end of it, instead of just saying, Hey, these were the facts. This is, you know, um, this is what happened. Uh, if you guys have any questions, let me know. You know what I mean? Instead of like, like yeah. it was like an infomercial for why Gracie university is better than all these other boo-boo schools out there that hurt people. You know what I mean? It just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't strike. I, I agree with you on that. It doesn't, it kind of strikes, strikes me the wrong way too. And, you know, I, I actually, and again, I, I'm not a black belt, I'm a purple belt. So take that, take this for what it's worth. But I just think he's wrong about what he, a lot of the things he said, like, it's not the way we do things at my gym. I think it's a right separating higher belts and lower belts is a bad idea. I think it should be the, I think the more you get to roll with higher belts, the better and safer you are. I feel so much safer rolling with a black belt than I do with a big new white belt, like way, way safer. Agreed. And I still roll with new white belts. I have a friend who's my age, who's a brown belt, really good. He says he loves rolling with black belts and he loves rolling with new white belts. He said the black belts, my jujitsu gets better and the white belt, Show me I can win a street fight, basically. So, you know, I've been going over to River Oaks gym and there's new white belts in there a lot now. And I roll with them, but I roll with them just to remind myself what a, what a street fight <laughs> is like, you know? And then after one yeah. or two, you know, and I'm always literally during the rolls, I'm like, slow down, relax. Because I, I was the same way. I was hyper. I, you know, I was trying to, you know, move fast when I started out you know, burning too much energy. And I wish somebody would have been like, slow down, take yeah. a breath, calm down. And then I go, and then I, after I'm done, I go roll with a purple belt or a brown belt or a black belt and actually work on getting better at jujitsu. So, right. <laughs> so I just think he's wrong about that. And, and, and I think that approach is not the approach that a lot of gyms use, nor should they use. And again, my opinion is as a purple belt is worthless, but that's my opinion. So, that was really, in addition, like you're saying, it kind of looks bad. I just don't agree with his philosophy. I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I think the philosophy that you and I train under is a, is a, yeah. is a better philosophy. I, I just, I just do.
episode. I honestly think he's in the minority of the jujitsu community with that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, me too. Me too. Because I, I, like you mentioned, even as a white belt, I, I loved roll. I lo I still do, and love rolling with higher belts. I, yeah. I enjoy the experience of someone showing me, you know, what the possibilities are. Like you mentioned earlier, there's levels to it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um. And I think if that white belt in this situation was honestly worried about rolling with the black belt world champ, then I think he would have just said no. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah. I think there's also a little bit of ego going on there and whatnot no and, doubt. you know, com no you know, competitiveness, you know, but I don't know. It's, it's like one of those, it's just one of those situations where you're, no matter what happens in it, no one's going to be happy. You know what yeah. I mean? Like. No one's going to be happy whether it was Henner or someone else. You know, there's always yeah. going to be backlash. And, you know, people people talking about, you know, he like sold out the community for money and whatnot. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I think he just has a point of view that 90, I would say 75% of the community doesn't share. You know what yeah. I mean? So, And, and um, I would say, by which, the way, anybody that says he sold himself out, uh, sold the community out is, is, is full of it. Okay. He's got yeah. plenty of money. Hundred thousand dollars does not change his lifestyle at all. Yeah, I don't think he was doing it for money. He doesn't need that money. Uh, I just think he was wrong. <laughs> like, you, like you're saying, I just don't. I just like I would have loved to been the lawyer cross examining him because I would have asked him a lot of questions about some of his philosophy because I just, I, I mean, maybe it works for him and maybe it works for. His students and what he does i don't want to criticize it as far as that goes but it's not the way we do it at least in my experience in a lot of gyms we just don't do it that yeah way. so so that's really uh he, 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 look if they had paid him two or three million dollars that's a sellout yeah a uh, hundred thousand dollar check for henry, henry grace it doesn't change his lifestyle at all so completely agree completely agree so hey but brian we like to end every show with yep. one question. If you could give one piece of advice to a brand new white belt starting off in jujitsu, what would it be? Slow down. I would say relax and slow down. And that is very, very hard to do. When, especially when you first start out and you have no idea where to put your body, what to do. You're nervous, you get choked all the time. But it's the, the, the quicker you realize that when you, at least when you're in the, in the gym, that you're not fighting, you're doing jujitsu. Yeah. The quicker you realize that, the quicker your jujitsu gets better. The analogy that I've been thinking about a lot is, can you imagine somebody that goes to CrossFit and literally does the full max workout at full speed every single time, or somebody that goes and lift weights and every single time they lift weights, they max out on the bench. That would be preposterous. It would be so stupid and everybody would think it's stupid and they would get hurt. What's the difference between going 110% every single time you do jujitsu? It's just not smart. You, you, nobody, it's just athletes don't do that. Like yeah. you're supposed to be in there getting better at the skill. And so I would just say, slow down, relax. Don't look at it as a fight. <clears throat> look at it as jujitsu. You're trying to get better at jujitsu. Awesome, man. I completely agree with that. And Thinking of it as jujitsu, I think, is an extremely underrated mindset, especially when first starting. Because I definitely thought I was fighting for my life every single time. Me too. Time. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, but hey, Brian, if people if uh, people want to follow you or get in contact with you, what's the best way that they can do it? Uh, law firm is vbattorneys.com. That's V as in Victor, B as in Brian, vbattorneys.com. My personal website where I have my own podcast on leadership is brianbeckham.org. And that's B-E-C-K-C-O-M, B-E-C-K-C-O. I'm kind of an unusual spelling. I'm on all the social medias, YouTube, all that stuff. But probably I'm most active on Instagram, which I think is where most jujitsu people are, at least nowadays. And it's Brian Beckham Lawyer on Instagram. So Come follow me, man. I have a lot of jujitsu comments. I have a lot of law comments. Anybody has any questions about any legal stuff that we touched on or anything like that? Uh, like I said, we fight for fighters. I am uh, really, really uh, privileged to be able to give something back to the jujitsu community. So anybody has any questions at all, you know, feel free to call me. I'll, I'll do my best to answer. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brian, for coming on the show today. 
Uh, the time flew by. This was a epic conversation. Lots of laughs, a lot of good time. So I'm super excited for people to listen to this at home. Let us know what you guys think at home. Comment down below on Spotify. Now you can leave a comment on every single Spotify episode if you guys want. Uh, hit us a DM and let us know what you guys think about this episode. And uh, thank you guys so much for listening and watching at home. And we'll catch you later. Peace. Oh, and no oil checks here. <laughs> <laughs>